HDMI ports have a huge problem and it's no secret. They're constantly breaking. I've done a lot of field research for this and I've contacted others in the repair community. I think everyone can agree that the problem is not moving devices around with the HDMI cable connected. <laughs> no way. The only logical conclusion I could come up with was simple. The HDMI port is too small. This would never and could never happen on your Nintendo 64. This wouldn't have happened on your GameCube. Those latch onto the frame. They can be used as melee weapons. That's right, HDMI ports are too small. Too small. I'm sorry? Too small. And inherently weak against everyday forces that will be applied. The solution to this problem was equally as simple and quite baffling that manufacturers haven't figured this out. Make the HDMI port big. So engineers, you can send your thanks and licensing requests to my email, but for us, we need to get back to the start of this project. Now bear in mind, this is simply going to be a prototype for the interface that will eventually replace your household HDMI and fancy little display ports. The final product will be made of metal, probably rare earth stuff or like signal or whatever, and weigh roughly 10 kilograms. I took a regular sized HDMI port and scaled it up by a thousand percent. I made some slight modifications so things would fit together a bit nicer and I started printing all the pieces. Obviously, I want this to have a chance at functioning, so I've created a hole to run the wires through the back of this male HDMI connector. The wires will be attached to the end of the pins. For this to work, I wanted to pick up some conductive copper tape, and conveniently it was the same width as the pins. I also grabbed a pine sill soldering tool to try out. This video isn't sponsored because they never responded to my email, pine sill, but this does work really well. The big question, would the solder stick? And thankfully, the answer was yes. I also made sure there was conductivity between both ends of the tape. Next up was carefully wrapping all 19 of the pins. These were printed with silk PLA for a nice shine, but the copper tape looks even better. Once all the pins were wrapped, it was time to strip some wire, tin the tips, and attach them to the pins. Some people use special tools to hold the wire while tinning the tip of it with solder. I prefer to let the wire precariously roll around the table while I attempt to basically thread it like a needle. It's almost like I own a device that could make the tool that holds wires for solder. Whatever. I stripped, tinned, and attached all 19 wires and pins. I randomized the colors used based on, well, whatever I had available. My eyes were on the prize, and not necessarily the steps in order to get there. But it was quite satisfying to see a bundle of wires all ready to go. Fitting the pins into their channels was a combination of satisfying and frustrating. These were designed with almost no tolerance or gap between the parts. On a positive note, I wouldn't be using any glue for this. Using a deburring tool, I shaved the sides of the pins so that they would actually fit. I meticulously fed all the wires through the holes in the back and pressed each one into their little groove. I was left with a really cool looking huge connector and a rat's nest of wires below it, but it was an organized rat's nest. Then I threaded each wire through its respective hole in the base of the plug. As fun as it was to run wires for a second time, I wasn't out of the woods yet. Every piece that gets added means threading 19 floppy wires, and unfortunately for me, this isn't the last piece. Tired of wires for now, I moved on to the female HDMI port. This one had a lot of support material. Unfortunately, the shape has overhangs no matter which way you print it, and instead of splitting it up, I wanted to print it in one go. This piece was printed in PLA+, so I could definitely be a bit more rough with removing the supports. However, our next piece was printed in silk PLA, making it a bit more fragile when it comes to snapping pieces off. 
I don't like to do a whole lot of post-processing or painting of my projects, so I end up using a combination of different colored filaments and materials instead of just practicing painting. Next, I press the tray and shell together. In hindsight, I probably should have done the pins first, but you print and learn, right? Back to tedious work, I had 19 more pins to cover with conductive tape. These were incredibly fragile. I had to hold each pin as I cut the supports away because the parts were so thin and right along the layer lines that they could snap with even the slightest pressure. Looking back, I wish I had printed these as individual parts rather than connected in a tray. But again, print and learn. The tape is made from a really thin layer of copper. It's kind of like gold foil, but not flaky. This made it a lot easier to wrap around the smaller ends of the pins and conform better to their shape. Once all the pins were wrapped, I shaved down the sides of them so they'd fit in the slots better. In the end, I was left with a tremendous feeling of satisfaction at this gigantic HDMI port. This was exactly what I had envisioned. With the HDMI port being the size of a Nintendo GameCube console, it should be nearly indestructible. The final product wouldn't even be soldered to the board. It would be welded. Now back to that dreaded plug. I printed a back cover to manage the wires a bit better. They would all converge into a much smaller footprint while still remaining separated and organized. Just like the previous steps, this meant feeding 19 more wires through something one by one. The finish line for this project was getting closer with every wire though. Now with the slack pulled on the wires, I could push this panel flush. I made four screw holes to keep it all together. The next step was disassembling an actual HDMI cable, at least one end of it. The rubberized housing is easy enough to cut away with a craft knife. Upon peeling it apart, I was left with every technician's nightmare, a form-fitted mass of solidified hot glue. Don't get me wrong, hot glue is used in a lot of electronics. It holds things together, it provides a moisture barrier, it helps keep things from getting bent the wrong way, but unfortunately, it also makes repairs and teardowns quite a bit more annoying. Not complicated, but annoying. I really wanted to see how these pins are connected, and I was hopeful that I could just color match the wires by using a diagram online. Hot glue is pretty weak when isopropyl alcohol is applied. It loses all of its stickiness and can sometimes just crumble and flake apart. Sadly, even after removing all the hot glue, the pinout and wire colors didn't match any diagrams I could find. Instead, I chose to just chop the connector off and go in a different direction. I stripped away the primary jacket of the cable. This reveals hundreds of silver strands, but don't be alarmed. These are just EMI shielding surrounding the main wires within. They can be folded down or simply cut away entirely. Now begins what may be the single most tedious step in the project. I need to manually trace the pins of the connector all the way to the exposed wires I've created. I simply soldered a copper strand onto the end of my multimeter probe and inserted it in one of the pin slots on the connector. Then using continuity or diode mode, I simply touched my other probe to the end of the exposed wire and waited to find a match. So let me give you an example. I'll insert my probe into the third hole in the bottom row of pins. I want this to match up with the same wire on the new HDMI XL connector. Once I find the match, I'll slip a heat shrink tube over the corresponding wire, then solder the two together. To the surprise of no one, I repeated this process 19 times, tracing, splicing, and organizing. Once this absolutely riveting experience is over, I slid all the heat shrink tubes as low as they would go towards the cable. This should keep things from shorting out or interfering with one another. Using a heat gun, I sealed all the shrink tubes and my wiring harness was essentially complete. This was ugly though, and nobody wants to see a bundle of partially exposed wires and EMI shielding. Thankfully, I thought ahead and printed this form-fitting coupler. It should perfectly hide the bundle and beautifully chamfer into the original cable. I had finally done it. In theory, this was a fully functioning HDMI cable. And I know what everybody's asking, do the parts actually fit together? And the answer is of course, yes, with some force, they should fit perfectly together and make contact with all the pins, I think. This creation is beautiful, the size of a Nintendo GameCube, and when it's finally made of metal, it will be even more durable. I'll go ahead and tin the pins for the port. This was a bit tricky as you can't really press your iron directly to the surface. This would immediately melt the plastic.
Instead, I just built up solder on the end of my iron and let it make contact with the copper coating. This should make Chase's life a bit easier. Oh, right, I should mention now that I don't really have a device to try this on. Instead, I'll be sending it to my good pal Chase Fournier so he can install this on an actual console and see if it works. And that's that. I'm sorry to leave you all on a cliffhanger, but I only set out to make the largest HDMI port I could, and you'll have to head over to Chase's video linked on screen and in the description to see if it ended up working. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe for more big tech, and I'll see you next time.